Sunday Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television, proudly presents... Screen Director's Playhouse, star Miss Olivia de Havilland, production The Dark Mirror, director Robert Siodmak... Hollywood screen directors present a reflection on murder. The motion picture drama, The Dark Mirror, starring Academy Award winner Miss Olivia de Havilland. Tonight, Miss de Havilland recreates her original dual role in the film as she plays the twin parts of Ruth and Terry. In a fashionable Fifth Avenue apartment, Dr. Frank Peralta was murdered. Stabbed in the back. The only evidence of disorder was a shattered mirror. Arrested on suspicion of murder was Miss Terry Collins, Dr. Peralta's fiancée, and her identical twin sister, Ruth. Mr. District Attorney, we've been at this questioning for hours and getting nowhere. Now, look, identical twins. Which one of you girls was with Dr. Peralta last night? One of us spent the evening at Jefferson Park, and the other... Never mind. How about you, sister? One of us stayed home. Uh, But which one did which is what I'm asking. Which one did which? One of us. That's what I've been hearing for hours. One of us spent the evening at Jefferson Park, and one of us stayed home... Dr. Elliot, you're a psychologist and authority on the subject of identical twins, and you're personally acquainted with these girls, and I like... Now, hold it, Lieutenant Stevenson. I knew these girls one at a time. When they were working at the newspaper counter in my office building, I didn't know they were twins. Dr. Elliot, you knew Dr. Peralta and had conversation with him the day he was murdered. He asked you if you ever came across a case of split personality and whether it was dangerous. All right? Clarify that. I told him I couldn't say that he had to cite a specific case. Then he said, I had a battle with her this morning, and I'm seeing her tonight. Seeing who tonight? Miss Collins, I suppose. Which one? I haven't the faintest idea. Uh, Where do we go from here, Mr. District Attorney? Nowhere. You haven't a witness that can tell one girl from the other. I wouldn't have a chance in court. Young ladies, one of you is a murderess. You've killed a man in cold blood. The other is an accomplice. But the law forbids the indiscriminate prosecution of more than one person in order to make sure of one guilty one. I have no words adequate to express my contempt for both of you. Now get out. We're free? You're free. Goodbye, Lieutenant. Au revoir, Miss Collins. All right, sit down, Doc. I'm a peculiar guy. I don't like the perfect crime, not even in books. So? You're a twin expert. Do you know anything, whatever, about these two dames that would give me a chance to begin work? Oh, sure. The crime. You don't just suppose anyone could commit a murder, do you? Look, you're going to have to be very patient with me. Uh, Just what do you mean by that? Character, personality. Not even nature can duplicate character. Even in twins. One of the Collins girls could... And one couldn't commit murder. That's all there is to it. Doc, do you often interview twins? Often. But not for the police. Yeah, 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 yeah. You like one of those girls. Now, suppose she's innocent, living with a killer. And one of them killed once with a knife. Don't you think there's a chance she'll kill again? Her sister, if she ever became nervous about her? There's no doubt about it. I'll never ask you the name or proof. It's out of the question, Lieutenant. I'm not a detective. Besides, I didn't say I was in love with the girl. I simply said I like her. But how do I know she wasn't the one who did it? Come in. Hiya, Doc. Glad to see you. I'm Terry. That's Ruth. That simplifies things immeasurably. Thank you. It's been two weeks since we've seen you, Doctor. 
And surely you've seen the papers. We're celebrities now. And out of a job, too, I gather, Terry. And I don't know who'll hire us either after what the district attorney said. That's exactly why I'm here. You know, I'm an old twin collector, and I'm going to add you two to my collection. $25 a week apiece, and you appear in my laboratory three times a week for an hour. For science. What do you say, Ruth? I don't think we're interested. I don't like the idea of being a guinea pig. I don't want to press you, but if you're afraid... We have nothing to be afraid of, Doctor. Nothing but snoopers. Well, in that case, there's nothing more to be said. Ruth, I think we should do it. I don't think Dr. Elliot's a snooper, and we could certainly use the money. You don't mind being asked a lot of personal questions? Why should I, or why should you? We have nothing to fear. And we've always liked Dr. Elliot. Both of us. Ruth, I hope you can see things Terry's way. But if you can't, I'll understand and no harm done. Bye now. Ruth, what's the matter with you? Do you think that was very wise? Why? What are you afraid of? I'm not afraid. There's... Don't lie about it, Ruth. You are afraid. You're more and more afraid every day. Why? Terry, you know very well what it is. You think I killed him. Why don't you admit it? But I don't. You know I don't. Then why are you so frightened? Oh, Terry, if they knew which one of us was in Dr. Peralta's apartment that night, you know what that would mean. He proposed to me there, and I said yes. Why should I kill him? I know that, dear. I know you didn't do it. I know it so well that I'm willing to do anything to keep them from learning you were in his apartment that night. That's the only reason I'm frightened. Believe me, dear. Please believe me. Well, then, is there anything about yourself that you're afraid for Elliot to learn? Oh, of course not. Well, then, stop worrying. There's no need for it. And besides, he's very good-looking. I like him. After all the tests we've made in this laboratory, Terry, I believe I can tell you and Ruth apart. Well, you're the first one who ever could. <laughs> who do you like best? Ruth or... Naturally you, Terry. Let's get down to business again. Now, these are pictures of ink blots. Just blobs of ink and the paper folded over. Tell me what you see in the blots. Why? That's just another way of examining personality. Hmm. This blot... Looks like a lamb. Under its front paws are two men, face down, with their arms outstretched. It all seems symbolic of something. A lamb looks so innocent, but it has two men under its paws. Symbolic of what? The lamb of death. <laughs> now, what does this blot represent to you, Ruth? Well... I see a drum majorette with a high bearskin shako. She's very graceful and light-footed. Mm. Your mind runs toward pleasantry. You know, you were telling me you always leaned on Terry. Yes. All my life, Terry's been like an older sister to me, always helping and protecting me. I remember once when I was about 16, I was crazy about a boy, Freddie Eklund... But Terry simply couldn't stand him. She said he wasn't on the level, and that's the way it turned out. He wasn't. Now, how'd you find out? He dated Terry one night, and she told me. Oh, but that's kid stuff. Let's try another experiment, Ruth. I'm going to give you some words. As soon as you hear the word, you answer with the first word that comes to your mind, you see? Mm-hmm. Table. Um, chair. Lamp. Shade. Dark. Night. Mirror. Death. But Ruth, how could you have said it? When he said mirror and you said death, it proved you were scared. I didn't know. It just popped out. I don't understand. But I do. I understand some of that mumbo-jumbo. And it's a dead giveaway that it's still in your mind and that I had something to do with it. I'm not afraid of him. I can do that stuff 24 hours a day and beat him at it every time. It's you I'm worried about. But Terry... I think you're wrong about Scott Elliott. He isn't trying to use me. He's pretty grand, you know. You're falling in love with him, aren't you, Ruth? 
Oh, you keep saying that to me all the time. Of course not. Well, don't. Moon. Beans. White. Black. King. Queen. Death. Mirror. How is my character development, Doctor? Very interesting, my dear Terry. Perhaps you've read my mind well enough to know that I might like seeing you. That's a mighty fine invitation. But I'll have to wait until we finished our tests. All right. But the first night afterward, it's a date. You won't forget. Cross my heart. Goodbye now. Detective Lieutenant Stevenson, please. Hello, uh, Scott Elliott, Lieutenant. I have some news for you. One of our young ladies is insane. Very clever, very intelligent, but insane. <laughs> You have been listening to Act One of The Dark Mirror, starring Miss Olivia de Havilland and presented by RCA Victor. Nowadays, the most popular American sport next to baseball is the television boasting contest. Well, when you own RCA Victor's superb new 16-inch console, the TC-167, you'll win all such contests hands down. For this magnificent set is a champion on count after count. It's aristocratic cabinet. It's built-in antenna. It's phonojack for attaining, attaching any record player. It's glorious RCA Victor golden throat tone. As for the giant 16-inch pictures, they're RCA Victor's finest, which means the world's finest. When you unveil this RCA Victor champion to your awestruck neighbors and accidentally tell them the price, they'll think you're an investment wizard. For the suggested list price of the TC-167, slightly higher in some locations, is only $399.95 plus federal tax. And the returns on that investment... Daily entertainment through years of that matchless performance synonymous with RCA Victor Television. America's first, America's finest, America's favorite. Now back to the Screen Director's Playhouse production of The Dark Mirror, starring Miss Olivia de Havilland in her original twin roles of Ruth and Terry with David Ellis as Scott Elliott. spend the evening with Dr. Elliot? Why, yes. I warned you to stay away from him. He's trying to pump you. Oh, I'm sorry, but I can't help but think he's pretty trustworthy. Ruth, it's getting late. Why don't you go to bed, darling? Wake up, Ruth. I said, wake up. Wake up. What? What? What's the matter? What's the matter? He was sobbing hysterically. It was pretty harrowing for a few minutes. Oh. Oh, you must be mistaken, Terry. Tonight wasn't the first time. It happened last night and the night before that. <gasps> don't you want to know what seems to be frightening you? Oh, I, I don't know whether I do or not. You keep repeating it over and over in your sleep. You're worried about one of us being crazy. Oh. oh, this is awful. It frightens me. The whole idea of talking and dreaming and sobbing and remembering nothing about it. Well, it can't be very pleasant. But it's really not so important. Just bad dreams. Oh, I... I don't know what to say. I... The night before last, you jumped out of bed screaming someone was putting the lights on and off. <laughs> Darling, the lights were never on. Oh, something's happening to me, and I don't know what it is. I don't understand it. 
I'm worried about you, Ruth. I must watch you more closely before something dreadful happens to you. Oh, I'm so scared. I don't know what to do. There, there. Just remember I'm with you. And I'm always going to be with you. No matter what happens. Well, Terry, this is one of your last tests. At the end of the week, I shall be forced to fire you. In other words, I can look forward to a date with you Saturday night? I'm afraid I can't make it. Who's my rival? You have no rival. Come on. Let's get on with the lie detector experiment. Hmm? You can ask me anything you wish. I have nothing to fear. I know that. You ready? Ready. Now, Ruth was telling me about a boy you knew in Ohio with whom she was in love and you didn't care very much for. Oh. Freddie Eklund. Why? What did she say? Hmm? She just said you told her he wasn't on the level and proved it. Was she complaining? Oh, good heavens, no. She looks upon you as her big sister. Did she tell you that I knew him first? No, I don't believe she did. Well, that's the truth of the matter. I met him first and introduced him to her. And he didn't care in the slightest for her, and I knew it. And then he started going around with her, without her even dreaming for one second that it was actually me that he was interested in. Now I know the answer. Lieutenant Stevenson, I invited you to my apartment to tell you positively that Ruth didn't do it. She isn't capable of murder. Well, that does narrow it down a bit. Terry's a paranoiac. A paranoiac has no more conscience, no more sense of right or wrong than than a two-year-old. A paranoiac is capable of doing anything. Of killing her sister, Ruth? Yes. We must do something to protect her. All right. Get hold of Ruth right away and break the news to her. No matter how hard it is. All right, I will. And watch out for yourself, or you'll be the new Dr. Peralta. Well, I don't figure very seriously in her calculations. She didn't mind those tests. They were just another challenge to her. Another opportunity to show the world what contempt she has for it. I still say, be careful, Doc, and tell Ruth right away. Hello, Ruth. Hello, Scott. How are you, dear? Ruth, are you alone? Yes. Why? Well, I don't want Terry to know, but I want you to come to my apartment as soon as possible. It's vitally important. I'll be right over. Scott. What? Ruth, but I just talked to you. What? Never mind, I'm glad you're here. I saw the light in your apartment. I've been walking, and I thought... Why, you're pale, darling. You look as if you've seen a ghost. Something like that. Hallucinations. What causes hallucinations? Hallucinations? Things you imagine you see or hear. Oh, bad nerves. Just nerves. Or a sick mind. Yes, a sick mind. Ruth, there's something I must tell you, but you're too emotionally upset to hear it now. Darling, please, go straight home and relax. I have some urgent business in the next minutes. Everything's going to be all right. I love you very much. I'll be all right. Goodbye, Scott. Lieutenant Stevenson, please. Lieutenant, Terry Collins will be in my apartment in the next few minutes pretending to be Ruth Collins. I don't have time to explain. All I know is that I'm going to play the role of a human booby trap. Stick by your telephone. Ruth, it's not an easy thing to tell you, but I feel that I should. Terry's not well. 
She's sick inside. And she needs your help. Sick? How? She's paranoid. She's twisted inside. That's absurd. I called you tonight because I want you to talk to her, Terry. I want you as the nearest and dearest to her to persuade her to go to her doctor and put herself in his care. And if I refuse to insult her with such incredible rot? But you mustn't. I can't tell you how important it is that she get this care immediately, Ruth. And if Ruth refuses? If you refuse, Terry. And you are Terry. I'm afraid I'll have to tell who killed Frank Peralta and why. There's nothing you'll be able to do about it. Whatever you guess. I'll remind you anyway. You killed Peralta because the same thing happened to you that has always happened to you before. Remember Freddie Eklund, the boy Ruth loved, who didn't want any part of you? Well, Dr. Peralta was in love with Ruth without even knowing she existed. How interesting. He romanced you and finally asked you to marry him. He didn't know there were twins. All he knew was that every now and then the girl at the newspaper counter brought him a warmth that he missed at other times. And that's what puzzled him. That's why he asked me about a split personality. You weren't aware of this until that night in the apartment when he spoke of this curious difference from time to time. Then you knew what had happened again. It was Ruth he was in love with, not you. So you made sure that if you couldn't have his love, neither should Ruth. Who else have you told this to? Nobody else so far. Terry, I implore you to go to your doctor and be guided. There's no necessity for that. There's nothing you can do about it. You're wasting your time. But haven't you forgotten Ruth? No. No one would take seriously the word of a girl who suffers from hallucinations. Or hasn't she told you? Just a minute. What do you mean by that? Oh, excuse me. Hello? Oh, yes, Lieutenant Stevenson. I've got to kill him. I'll stab right, him with these scissors. I'll be right over. Terry. Ruth's dead. She's killed herself. Does that surprise you? I'm sorry, Doc. The body's inside that room with the medical examiner. Go on in. Can you tell me what happened, Lieutenant? An overdose of sleeping pills. Why'd she do it? Her conscience. But she's free now, poor darling. And I have a right to some peace, too. Come on now. Make a clean breast of it. You'll feel better. She killed him. She was twisted inside. Scott told me tonight. You mean Ruth? No, Terry. I'm Ruth. She was sick inside with jealousy. That's why she killed him, Scott says. Wait a minute. You can't get away with it. You're Terry. Now, Scott, I thought you said you could tell us apart. Well, the test showed only what I've known for a long time, that she hated me, hated me from the bottom of her heart, because men found it easy enough to like me, but not her. The mirror. The mirror. I see Ruth there, in the mirror. Sorry, Terry. She's not dead! Put down that face, Terry. All right, Sergeant. Take her to headquarters. Somebody do something for me! Now, Terry, now. Save me! Take it easy now. Save me! Terry, Terry. Save me! I'm not at all surprised that she smashed the mirror. I'm sorry I had to fake Ruth's death, Doc, but... <laughs> Well, it was the only way I could get Terry to open up. Under the circumstances, Lieutenant, I forgive you. Scott, was the mirror me? The reflection was. That's what twins are, you know. Reflections of each other. Everything in reverse. What are they going to do with Terry? Don't worry, darling. She'll get the best that modern psychiatry can offer. Someday... Who knows? Someday, Scott. There will be a someday for Terry. I know it. I know it. And we'll be waiting for her, darling. You and I. You 
have just heard the last act of The Dark Mirror. And our star, Miss Olivia de Havilland, with our guest screen director, Robert C. Odmack, will be with us in just a moment. Ever hear of Hollywood astronomy? It's stargazing. Folks come out here and can't get enough of seeing stars. Stars in the street, stars in the stores, stars everywhere. But I've found myself an even better pastime. Star listening. Something you too can do. Hear all the greatest stars in the musical firmament on RCA Victor 45 records. You hear them easier, you hear them better. And you hear them at less cost on RCA Victor 45. You hear them easier because it's so much easier to play 45 records. They're so small. Only seven inches across, and the center opening that fits around the record changer mechanism is big. Naturally, the records are a pushover to put on. After that, one touch of one button gives you up to 50 minutes of music. And don't forget the easier storage of 45 records. Tuck them in with your books on ordinary bookshelves. RCA Victor 45 sound better because every note of music is recorded in the quality zone of the record. No distortion. And finally, the low cost will amaze you. A complete record player to plug into your present radio, Victrola phonograph, or television set for as little as $12.95. And 45 records start as low as 46 cents. But folks... I'm always of the opinion that seeing is believing. You should actually see the RCA Victor 45. Hear it and play it. Where? At your RCA Victor dealers. Do it tomorrow. Next Friday, another great star sounds the saber clash of high adventure on the screen director's playhouse. Our story is The Fighting O'Flynn. And recreating his original role will be Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. with screen director Arthur Pearson. Now, here again is tonight's star, Miss Olivia de Havilland. Ladies and gentlemen, if it's permissible for an actress to step out of her story, then it's only right that her director step out from behind the cameras. And so I'd like you all to meet the director of The Dark Mirror and of such other films as The Killers, The Spiral Staircase, and The Phantom Lady, Robert Siodmak. Thank you, my dear. Thank you very much. But tonight, nobody wants to hear about directors. Oh, that's no way for the guest of honor to talk. No, the honor doesn't belong to me, but to the screen director's playhouse. The honor of a performance by an actor is so superb that she has won her second Academy Award. Thank you very much. Well, first you won it for the award to each his own, and now for the heiress. But you know, they say in Hollywood that everything runs in three. So now you must do it once more. <laughs> Receiving a second Oscar is a thrill beyond explaining, but for the future, well, all I'm looking forward to is an opportunity to go on acting as well as I know how. And that gives us all something to look forward to. Good night, Olivia de Havilland. Good night. Good night, everyone. And good night to you, Miss Olivia de Havilland and Robert C. Odmack. Remember next Friday, Douglas Fairbanks and the Fighting O'Flynn with screen director Arthur Pearson, brought to you by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. <laughs> Nunnally Johnson's The Dark Mirror was presented through the courtesy of Universal International Pictures, who soon will release One Way Street, starring James Mason, Marta Torrin, and Dan Duryea. Miss Olivia de Havilland is currently starring in Paramount's The Heiress. Robert C. Odmack's latest production is the Universal International Picture Deported, starring Marta Torrin and Jeff Chandler. Included in tonight's cast were David Ellis, John Daner, Francis X. Bushman, Helen Andrews, and Frank Barton. The Dark Mirror was adapted for radio by Jack Rubin, and original music was composed and conducted by William Lava. Screen Director's Playhouse is produced by Howard Wiley and directed by Bill Karn. This is Jimmy Wallington speaking and inviting you to listen again next Friday when RCA Victor presents... Screen Director's Playhouse, star Douglas Fairbanks, production The Fighting O'Flynn... Director Arthur Pearson. It's the great J. Rupert Durante, next on NBC.